We're ready. Marrows, we are rolling. Okay, I'm you know, sorry. You know what I need, actually, on your main account? I don't know why, but your picture's not there. Like, I guess later, just we'll add it in. Okay. Okay. I just resent the email. So should I, you want me to admit? Yeah, I'm sorry to admit. Okay, let's do the admit. All right, I'm going to go on mute. You can get started. That's it. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is May Rose. I've been a tutor at Qualar Prep since 2016. I'm currently a medical student at Wall Cornell Medicine, and I'm excited to go over um, the new SAT, discuss some of the changes, and go through a sample test with everyone. Um, so we're going to start by just giving a few extra minutes to those who are continuously joining the waiting room. And um, once that happens, we'll begin. Oh, I want to add, today is a fancy group, Mayros. You did not know this. I want to share. This is all Brooklyn Tech. Every single person in the chat is Brooklyn Tech. So I'm very happy and excited to tell you that this is our batch. Cool. Awesome. This is All right. Brooklyn Tech Day. Cool. So um, thanks for sharing that, Francis. Um, we'll get started. I think now is a good time to start. Um, as I mentioned, um, my name is May Rose. I started tutoring at Queller since 2016. Since that time, it is now 2024. I've tutored SAT, ACT, um, other standardized exams such as, you know, AP. Um, so I've definitely been through a lot of standardized testing changes, and this is yet another one of them. Um, the new SAT, uh, as we know, uh, will be digital, but there also are uh, pretty major, actually, formatting changes um, to the actual test. So I'm excited to point some of those out and just go through a sample test with you all, discuss strategies, etc. cetera. Um, just in terms of the way that this conversation will work is that I have my iPad, um, which will allow me to go through questions live with everyone. Um, and there is the ability for individuals to chat with the host. So if any um, major questions do come up, um, please feel free to use the chat function. But otherwise, we'll be going through questions uh, one by one. OK, so um, just in terms of looking at the format. So as I mentioned, the format has changed where reading and writing, um, there are now 66 questions that look very different. The reading passages are now a lot shorter. That's probably the biggest change. And um, there also are explicit writing questions that require you to understand how to formulate a piece of text. Um, the math questions, as I was preparing for this today's session, I think a really big change is now you can use calculator for virtually every single question. That makes things a lot easier in terms of calculations, um, but you obviously need to know how to use the calculator um, properly. Um, today's and, um, focus will be. Mayors, I just wanna, I wanna, I wanna take one second to interrupt. Tomorrow we're gonna go in depth on how to use the Desmos calculator, so that's gonna be a very big deal. So I'm just letting everyone know that will be tomorrow's activity. All right, back on mute. Yes, and uh, today we're going to be focusing on reading and writing. So this is um, the first section that you're presented with. Um, the directions say that each question includes one or more passages. They may include a table or a graph. So basically, everything is embedded within the question itself. Again, this is somewhat unique uh, from previous uh, SAT versions where they would give you one big passage and have multiple questions on there. So I think um, this kind of requires almost a rewiring of the strategies or a rewiring of the brain and the way that you attack these questions. And I'll start discussing um, them now. All right, so to begin with, question one says, the spacecraft OSIS REX briefly made contact with the asteroid 101955 Bennu in 2020. NASA scientist Daniela Dell'Agostini reports that despite facing the unexpected obstacle of a surface mostly covered in boulders, OSIS REX successfully blank a sample of the surface, gathering pieces of it to bring back to Earth. So I think the biggest change in, um, you know, having a much shorter passage to work with is that this is all the information you are receiving to, to have a logical 
to have the ability to conclude to get a logical answer. So oftentimes students, uh, when I would was working with them, I would recommend, you know, if you don't understand one section of the passage, use the other section um, to really, you know, gain an understanding of what's going on. Here, that really isn't an option because you only have two sentences to answer the question. So it's really, really important that we're close reading um, and we're actively reading and really fi figuring out what's going on. And also, thinking of the question um, that is being asked. So the question that's being asked is which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word? In order to determine that, we need to determine what the text itself is saying. So very, uh, very generally, to get the main idea, I see that there's a spacecraft which made contact with an asteroid. And I see that a scientist is talking about um, this interaction. And the scientist is saying, despite facing unexpected obstacles of a surface covered in boulders, OSIS RX, so OSIS RX again is a spacecraft, successfully blanked a sample of the surface, gathering pieces of it back to Earth. So again, this is discussing an interaction between this OSIS RX, which we already know is a spacecraft, and the asteroid, which we know from this sentence here. So I know that this interaction has to, you know, depict that th these two things came in contact. And I also understand that it needs to indicate that the um, spacecraft gathered pieces of it, it being the asteroid, back to Earth. So the best choice that would indicate that would be choice B, collected. The spacecraft collected a sample of the asteroid surface, therefore gathering pieces of it and bringing it back to Earth. Question two says, research conducted by planetary scientist Katarina Miljakovic suggests that the moon surface may not accurately blank early impact events. When the moon was still forming, its surface was softer, and asteroids or meteoroid impacts would have left less, less of an impression. Thus, evidence of early impacts may no longer be present. Again, the same exact question. Which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase? So once again, I need to understand what's really being communicated to me in these two sentences to answer the actual question. Now, uh, this scientist, Katarina Miljakovic, suggests that the moon may not accurately blank early impact events. That means there has to be some, um, the verb that needs to fill in the blank needs to indicate um, some aspect of how the moon relates to early surface events. The next sentence tells us that early impacts may no longer be present because the moon was soft initially, and so early impacts won't be visible. Because of this, the best answer is A. The moon's surface may not accurately reflect early impact events, and the reasoning is provided immediately in the following sentence. Any other of the verbs, receive, evaluate, or mimic, don't make sense in the context of the moon as an object. So another suggestion that I have for questions like these, especially given that they're quite short, um, another really great st strategy is that once you've made your answer choice clear and once you've chosen an answer choice, it's it would be excellent to substitute this answer choice back into the question um, stem. So doing so just really allows you to confirm that you have made the right decision. Okay, question three. Handedness, a preferential use of either the right or left hand typically is easy to observe in humans. Because this trait is present, but less blank in many other animals, animal behavior researchers often employ tasks specifically designed to reveal individual animals' preferences for a certain hand or paw. Which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase? So once again, we see a repetition, the question type, but there is just a different scenario or a different set of sentences um, that you need to answer the question. All right, so um, what is the setup here? So we have this discussion of handedness and we we're contrasting handedness seen in humans versus ha handedness seen in animals. So clearly, um, this is something that is important to be studied because they're talking about researchers who study this um, actual phenomena of handedness in animals. Um, secondly, there's a contrast that's really important to understand. The contrast is saying that this trait is present in human, uh, sorry, this trait is present in animals, but there is less of something in animals. So what would make the most sense? The most sense would be made by choice A. This trait is present, however, it's less recognizable in many other animals, which is why the tasks are designed to reveal individual animals' preferences for a certain hand or paw. And if you think about it, logically, that makes sense. If we if we 
uh, look at dogs or cats or any other animals, we won't necessarily know what their handedness is. Typically, they use multiple hands. Um, and so these types of tasks that the researchers are using are helpful in figuring out or revealing the preference for a certain hand or paw. Once again, plugging in all of the other answer choices, B through D, show you that B through D are incorrect. Intriguing is incorrect because there is no need for a contrast with the word intriguing. Clearly, this is intriguing in both humans and animals. That's why it's being studied. Similarly, significant doesn't make sense. Um, it clearly is significant in animals. So the, the phrase, but less significant, would rule this out. And same exact reasoning for choice D. Now we can move on to question four. So question four states, it is by no means blank to recognize the influence of Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch on Elie Benissadar's paintings. Indeed, Benissadar himself cites Bosch as an inspiration. However, some scholars have suggested that the ancient Mesopotamian poem, Epic of Gilgamesh, may have had a far greater impact on Benissadar's work. Once again, um, same exact question type, but different setup. So now we're talking about multiple characters. And I think in such small sections of text, it would be really helpful to understand all the multiple characters or time periods or context introduced. So we have we have a Dutch painter, Hieronymus Bosch. We have another um, character, Ali ben, uh, Sadar. And we have this discussion of ancient Mesopotamia and the Epic of Gilgamesh. So now the question is, how do these all relate to one another? So question, uh, the first sentence is saying, it is by no means blank to recognize the influence of Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch on Ali Benissadar's paintings. And the second sentence is saying, indeed, which is providing emphasis, that Benissadar himself cites Bosch as an inspiration. The next sentence is establishing a contrast that, however, some scholars have suggested that the Asian Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian poem had a great, a far greater impact. Now, clearly, the first two sentences are really emphasizing the fact that there was a significant influence um, of Bosch on Ali Benisadir. Therefore, what makes the most sense in this blank is... Um, is something, again, once again, emphasizing that significance. And the best answer for that is choice C. It is by no means unimportant to recognize the influence of the painter. The, word, the phrase by no means indicates that it is therefore important. Does that make sense to everyone? The next text um, now shows you another example of a different type of question. So this question is asking, um, which choice is best states the main purpose of the text? So I'm going to give everyone like 30 seconds to quickly read it before I start analyzing. Okay, so once again, um, we have a short piece of text. They tell you that the text is adapted from Susan Glasspell's 1912 short story out there. And they give you context that there's an elderly shop owner looking at a picture that he recently acquired and hopes to sell. It did seem like the picture failed to fit in with the rest of the shop. A persuasive young fellow who claimed he was closing out his stock let the old man have it for what he called a song. It was only a little out-of-the-way store which subsisted chiefly on the framing of pictures. The old man looked around at his views of the city, his pictures of cats and dogs, his flaming bits of landscapes. Don't belong in here, he fumed. And yet the old man was secretly proud of his acquisition. There was a hidden dignity in his scowling as he shuffled about, pondering the least ridiculous place for the picture. Which choice best states the main purpose of the text? So again, in cases like these where you have a short text to really work with, you have to understand how each aspect of the text relates to one another. If we go through the choices, we can determine the best answer choice. Um, A, to reveal the shop owner's conflicted feelings about the new picture. This matches the text exactly. 
the first the first paragraph seems to be um, talking about a very negative impression of the picture. The first sentence states the picture failed to fit in. Um, after that, you know, the the text describes that the old man looked around at his view of the city, cats and dogs flaming with the landscapes, and then the old man fumed or angrily stated that the picture doesn't belong in here. Don't belong in here. That's referring to the actual picture at hand being discussed. Now, the next paragraph is actually talking slightly more positively about the picture. And yet the old man was secretly proud of his acquisition, the acquisition being the picture, and you're told about that in the context provided to you at the beginning, which is why it's very important to read the context at the, at the beginning. It also says there was a hidden dignity in his scowling. So therefore, again, this is giving off more of a positive impression. So choice A matches that well. However, I would always recommend um, using process of elimination to guide your answer choices. Choice B says, convey the shop owner's resentment of the person he got the new picture of from. Although it is discussed who he got the picture from, we have to keep in mind, what is the question asking? The question is asking the main purpose. And the discussion of who he got the um, picture from is only in one sentence. So therefore, this is too specific to be the main idea. Choice C, describe the items the shop owner most highly prizes. This is also incorrect because while we know of other items, such as views of the city, pictures of cats and dogs, flaming bits of landscapes, we do not know, we do not have a relative sense of what he prizes the most, etc. D, explain differences between the new picture and the other pictures in the shop. The only really information that we have about the new picture is that it's out of the way and not matching with everything else. We don't know much aside from that, so D is also incorrect. This makes the best answer A. Number six. The following text is from the 1923 poem, Black Finger by Angelina Weld Grimke, a Black American writer. A cypress is a type of evergreen tree. So again, once again, they're giving you context, both to orient you to the time, to the piece of text that you're reading, and to the author. They're also providing you um, with context about what you're going to be seeing in the text, which is that a cypress is a type of evergreen tree. Now you read the poem. I have just seen a most beautiful thing, slim and still against a gold, gold sty sky. A straight black cypress, sensitive, exquisite, a black finger pointing upwards. Why beautiful sting still finger are you black and why are you pointing upwards? Which choice describes the overall structure of the text? So this is not asking about the main idea. This is more so asking you about how the reader chooses to organize their piece of work. So once again, um, using process el elimination, what can we say? Um, choice A, the speaker assesses a natural phenomena, then questions the accuracy of her assessment. Um, the first part is relatively correct that they are assessing this natural phenomena. So they're seeing or they're observing the most beautiful thing of a cypress in its environment. However, the second part of this answer makes it incorrect. She's not questioning the accuracy of her assessment. She's asking rhetorical questions um, within the poem itself. And the way that you can recognize this is by is through the context that they give you at the beginning, which is very helpful. Like a tree, a cypress points, a cypress is a tree. Therefore, by definition, it points upwards. And so this question of why are you pointing upwards is more rhetorical and not her questioning the accuracy of what she sees. We can now move on to choice B. The speaker describes a distinctive sight in nature, then ponders what meaning to attribute to that sight. So clearly she's describing a distinctive sight in nature, which is the cypress and its environment. Um, the second part then ponders what meaning to attribute to that sight is also correct. She's asking, why is the, um, the cypress in this way? Or why is it pointing upwards? Again, these are more so rhetorical larger questions that are thematic and not necessarily literal. Choice C can clearly be eliminated. There's no human behavior really discussed. Um, choice D can also be eliminated. There's no discussion of emotional, uh, emotional state or emotions anywhere. Okay. The following text is from Walt Whitman's 1860 poem, Calamus 24. I hear it is charged against me that I seek to destroy institutions, but really I am neither nor for nor against institutions. What indeed have I in common with them or what with the destruction of them? Only I will establish in the Manhattan, Manhattan and in every city of these states, inland and seaboard, 
and in the fields and woods and above every keel, ship, little or large, that dents the water, without edifices or rules or trustees or any arguments, the institution of the dear love of comrades. So one thing that I want to point out is, aside from giving you important context, what does this passage do? It gives you definitions that are in these brackets. So keel is defined as ship, Manhattan, Manhattan is actually Manhattan. And those definitions, understanding those, are important to actually successfully answering the question. Um, once again, the question is about structure. So which choice best describes the overall structure? Choice A, speaker question an increasingly prevalent attitude and summarizes her, his worldviews. Um, this is incorrect because there is no questioning that's happening. Immediately, the reader is starting off by saying, I hear it is charged against me. He's, he's saying this very emphatically, very certainly. B, speaker regrets his isolation from others, then predicts a profound change in society. There's no discussion of isolation from anyone. C, speaker concedes his personal shortcomings, then boasts of his many achievements. There's no shortcoming that he discusses. He says it is charged against me. Therefore, other people charge against charge me, or other people claim that I do this. They are posing charges against me. Um, therefore, he's not discussing his own shortcomings. Nor is he boasting many achievements, if any at all. He's simply saying it is charged against me, or I am accused of destroying institutions. Um, However, I'm neither for nor against. Uh, only I will establish in every single area, whether that means Manhattan, city, the states, fields, woods, ships, um, institution of dear love. Therefore, the best answer is D. The speaker addresses the criticism leveled against him. That is the charges that is discussed in the first line. And he then announces a grand ambition. And that ambition is he will establish the, an institution of love in every single place. Question eight. Mimosa tree evolved in East Asia where the beetle Bruchitus ternus preys on its seeds. In 1785, mimosa trees were introduced to North America, far from any bee ternus. But evolutionary links between predators and their prey can persist across countries and continents. Around 2001, bee ternus was introduced in southeastern North America near where botanists Shu Mi Chang and colleagues had been monitoring mimosa trees. Within a year, 93% of the trees had been attacked by the beetles. What choice best describes the function of the third sentence is the overall structure of the text. Now, what is the overall structure of the text telling you? The overall structure of the text is telling you that um, we are discussing the evolution of the um, mimosa tree and the discussion of the beetle of Bruchitus ternus. So in 1785, the mimosa trees were in North America and there was no bee ternus. But in 2001... Um, B. Tyrannus became populated in southeastern North America, and then within a year, um, trees, uh, the mimosa trees were attacked by the beetles. So the sentence underlined is indicating what? It's indicating evolutionary links between predators and prey can persist across centuries and continents. And careful reading shows us that this matches what we're being presented with. We start off in 1785. And were then brought to 2001. So therefore indicating that even though in 1785 there was no B. Terranus, once we're in the 2000s um, and the B. Terranus is introduced in southeastern North America, that predator-prey relationship establishes itself once again. So we can again use possible elimination. Choice A, it states the hypothesis that Chang and colleagues had set out to investigate using mimosa trees and B. Terranus. Incorrect. There is no hypothesis or scientific investigation discussed of Chang. It is only discussed that they were set up there monitoring most of trees. B. It presents a generalization that is exemplified by the discussion of the mimosa trees and B. Tyrannus. Well, first of all, it is correct that the underlying sentence is indeed a generalization. A generalization. All the sentence is saying is evolutionary links between predators and prey can persist across centuries and continents. There is no further information given. However, the case of the mimosa trees and B. Terranus exemplifies this. As I already mentioned, we start off in 1785 and then we're brought to 2001. Further, um, we're brought from East Asia to North America. East Asia was where it was first discussed that this beetle preys on the seeds of the mimosa tree. And then we say in North America, this also started happening to the extent that 93% of trees were attacked by beetles. So this indeed first um, 
the sentence underlined therefore presents a generalization that is exemplified or demonstrated by the discussion of mimosa trees and B. taranus. Choice C offers an alternative explanation for the findings of Chang and colleague. Once again, the only mention of Chang and colleagues is that they were monitoring the trees. There's no discussion of why they were monitoring them, etc. So C is out. D provides context that clarifies why the species mentioned spreads to new locations. Um, that is also incorrect because there is no context given by the sentence. The sentence is stating something that is basically a fact. Um, secondly, the sentence is not explaining why the species spread. It is simply saying that links remain um, throughout con continents and centuries. It's not specifying how the beetles came from one country to another or traverse time periods. Um, therefore, there is no context provided about the why. So choice B is the best answer. Okay. Um, this is another type of formatting that is important to be familiar with for the new SAT. Um, typically, in previous exams, they would pose old questions. and uh, Sorry, they would pose um, two types of text and uh, have a series of questions asking you about the relationship between text one and text two. This is the same type of setup, but again, a much, much shorter prompt. Text one, conventional wisdom long held that human societal systems evolved in stages, beginning with hunter-gatherers forming small bands of members with roughly equal status. The shift to agriculture about 12,000 years ago sparked population growth that led to the emergence of groups with hierarchical structures, association of clans first, then chiefdoms, and finally bureaucratic states. Text two. In a 2021 book, anthropologist David Graber and archaeologist David Wengro maintain humans have always been socially flexible, alternately forming systems based on hierarchy and collective ones with decentralized leadership. The authors point to evidence that as far as 50,000 years ago, some hunter-gatherers adjusted their social structures seasonally, at times dispersing in small groups, but also assembling into communities that included esteemed individuals. Based on the text, how would Grabber and Wengro, text two, most likely respond to the conventional wisdom presented in text one? So this is asking you um, your understanding of how the two texts relate to one another, whether they agree, support one another, disagree with one another, uh, qualify one another, or add another layer to the argument. So again, the best way to go through these questions is to follow process of elimination. Um, Choice A, choice A, B, C can be eliminated, and choice D is the correct answer. I think for the purpose of time, um, given that we have around 60 questions to go through, I, I'm not going to be able to eliminate every single question for every single answer, um, so I'll do my best to explain why the correct answer is correct. Um, the correct answer is, sorry, it's not D, it's B. By disputing the idea that developments in social structures have followed a linear progression through distinct stages. Why is this answer correct? This answer is correct because text one states, um, the shift to agriculture 12,000 years ago sparked population growth leading to the emergence of groups with hierarchical structures, first clans, then chiefdoms, and finally bureaucratic states. They state it very linearly, um, what is happening in what order. However, text two constantly mentions this idea of social flexibility or this idea of adjusting social structures based on the needs. Um, and so while choice, while text one makes it seem more linear, text two is indicating that there is flexibility and variety. This is exactly what choice B says. Question 10. The following text is adapted from Francis um, Hod Hodgson Burnett's 1911 novel, The Secret Garden. Mary, a young girl, recently found an overgrown hidden garden. Mary was Mary was an odd, determined little person, and now she had something to be determined about. She was very absorbed indeed. She worked and dug and pulled up weeds steadily, only becoming more pleased in her work every hour instead of tiring. It seemed to her like a fascinating sort of play. What choice best states the main idea? Looking at this question, 
and understanding again the contact presented to you shows that there's a very positive association with this garden mary is working at this steadily she's becoming pleased with her work and not getting tired she's fascinated by it and she thinks it's a sort of play that matches best with choice d that she feels very satisfied taking care of the garden choice a and b are too negative and choice C is out of scope. There's no discussion of her creating a space to flood. The following text is from Ezra Pound's 1909 poem, Hymn 3, based on the work of Marcantino Flamino. As a fragile and lovely flower unfolds its gleaming foliage on the breast of the fostering earth, if the dew and the rain draw it forth, so doth my tender mind flourish if it be fed with the sweet dew of the fostering spirit. Lacking this, it beginneth straight away to languish, even as a flower born upon dry earth, if the dew and the rain tend it not. Based on the text, in what way is the human mind like a flower? So in order to answer this question, we need to understand where the parallel is drawn between the human mind and the flower. That parallel is drawn here. So doth my tender mind flourish, if it be fed, with the sweet dew of the fostering spirit. This makes um, the correct answer choice, choice C, that the mind requires proper nourishment in order to thrive. The text says that the mind um, will flourish only if it's fed with the sweet dew of the fostering spirit. And again, we understand that um, flowers or any plant um, creatures require nourishment um, for their survival. 12. The following text is adapted from Jack London's 1903 novel, The Call of the Wild. Buck is a sled dog living with John Thornton in Yukon, Canada. Thornton alone held Buck. Rest of mankind was as nothing. Chance travelers might praise or pet him, but he was cold under it all. That too, from a demonstrated man, he would get up and walk away. When Thornton's partner, Hans and Pete, arrived on the long expected raft, Buck refused to notice them till they learned they were close to Thornton. After that, he tolerated them in a passive sort of way, accepting favors from them as though he favored them by accepting. Which choice best states the main idea? The correct answer to this is D. There's a constant emphasis that Buck and Thornton have a relationship that is unlike a relationship any of any other. It states the rest of mankind was as nothing, for Buck. Buck refused to notice people until he learned that they were close to Thornton. So again, there's this constant um, emphasis of the relationship between Buck and Thornton, and it is such that Buck holds Thornton in higher regard than any other person. 12. This is a type of question we need to understand how to read a graph to correctly answer. This will require not only reading the text, but also understanding the graph correctly. And so my recommendation is to first read the text provided so you understand the context of the graph, then read the graph, and finally, make sure to eliminate answer choices and choose the correct answer based on both the text and the graph. Organic farming is a method of growing food that tries to reduce environmental harm by using natural forms of pest control and avoiding fertilizers made with synthetic materials. Organic farms are still a small fraction of the total farms in the U.S. They've become more popular. According to the Department of Agriculture, 2016, California had between 2,600 and 2,800 organic farms and blank. Which choice most effectively uses data from the graph to complete the text? So again, we have to play a dual role where we have to confirm what is accurate based on the graph and what is not. The accurate answer is choice A. Washington had between 600 and 800 organic farms. We see Washington is here. The graph is here. And if we draw a line, this indicates indeed is between 600 and 800. All of the other choices are um, inaccurate based on reading the graph, which is why A is the correct answer. 14. Biologist Valentina Gomez Bahamon and her team have investigated two species 
of the fork-tailed flycatcher bird that lives in the same region in Colombia. But one such species migrates south for part of the year, the other doesn't. Researchers found that, due to slight differences in feather shape, the feathers of migratory forked tailed flycatcher males make a sound during flight higher pitched than that is made by the feathers of the non-migratory males. So again, we've constantly been um, given differences between these two species. The first is one species migrates south, the other doesn't. The second is differences in feather shape, which lead to a sound that is also different. Researchers hypothesize that fork-tailed flycatcher females are attracted to the specific sound made by the males of their own species, and that over time, females' preferences will drive further genetic and anatomical difference between the subspecies. Which finding, if true, would most directly support Gomez Bahamon and her team's hypothesis? The best answer to this is choice B. The reason for that requires you to first understand what is the hypothesis. The hypothesis is flycatcher females are attracted to the sound made by their own subspecies, and over time, females' preference will drive further genetic and anatomical divergence. Therefore, the finding has to relate to male-female attraction. The only choice that has to do with this is choice B. Choice C is generally talking about communication and pitching of sounds. Choice D is talking about breeding habits. Choice A is talking about migration. Again, choice B is the only choice that talks about male-female interaction. And what is it, the answer saying? Answer is saying over several generations, sound made by, made by the feathers of migratory males grow higher pitch relative to that made by the feathers of non-migratory female males. Why is this answer correct? The answer is correct because it's addressing time, which was also discussed in the hypothesis that over time this happens. Secondly, it's dis discussing the differences between the sounds of both species and it is the sound that the female is attracted to. So therefore, the best answer relating to the hypothesis is choice B. Okay, once again, we have a passage where we're presented not only with a text, but another piece of information. In this case, it's a table. Correctly answering this question will require an understanding of the text and an understanding of how to read the table. So let's begin. I recommend the same thing to first read the text and then to read the um, table putting and put the two together. Earth's atmosphere is bombarded by cosmic dust originating from several sources. Short period comets, SPCs, Particles from asteroid belt, ASTs, Halley type comets, HCCs, and Oort or cloud comets, OCCs. So again, all these abbreviations are actually being used in the table. So it's very important to know where you can find the definitions of these abbreviations. Some of the dust material vaporized in the atmosphere in a process called ablation. And the faster the particle moves, higher the rate of ablation. Astrophysicist Juan Diego Carrillo Sanchez led a team that calculated average ablation rates for elements in the dust, such as iron and potassium, and showed material in slower moving SPC or ASC dust has a lower rate than the same material in faster moving HTC or OCC dust. For example, whereas the average ablation rate for iron from AST dust is 28%, the average rate for blank. Now, answering this question is going to require a um, few, few steps. The first is understanding that this question is posing a contrast due to the word whereas. So the stuff following the comma needs to indicate that contrast. Secondly, it requires understanding what I underlined right here. Material and slower moving things has a lower rate of ablation than things moving fast. 
So we are comparing the same material in different um, in different mediums or in different systems. So off the bat, I know that the comparison has to be made with the same material, but in different environments. That automatically eliminates choice B and D because these are talking about different elements of sodium. We have to talk about iron and use the same um, use the same dust, but we have to see uh, or use the same element, but we have to see how it is in different environments. The contrast word of whereas also indicates I need to show a contrast between a, a ablation rate of 28% and AST DOS. What is that contrast going to be? It's going to be established by choice C because iron from HGC dust moves a lot faster. And that's depicting exactly what the text showed us here. They told us material in slower moving has a lower rate than material moving and faster moving. HTC is indeed faster moving and AST is slower moving, which is discussed in the sentence before the comma. All right, the next question is a set of, um, it's just a set paragraph and answering the question based on that. Our collectives at the United States and Vietnam based collected the propeller group or Cuba's Los Carpinteros are groups of artists who agree to work together. Perhaps for stylistic reasons or to advance certain shared political ideals or to help mitigate the cost of supplies in studio space. Regardless of these reasons, art collectives usually involve some collaboration among the artists. Based on a recent series of interviews with various art collectives, an arts journalist claims that this can be difficult for artists who are often used to having sole control over their work. So we're talking about this initiative of art collectives and how they're why how or why they come about. The last sentence ends off by talking about how the collective impacts those involved. The quotation is what's being asked about. Which quotation from the interviews best illustrates the journalist's claims? Well, the journalist claims what? The journalist claims that being involved in art collectives and having this collaboration, collaboration can be difficult for those who have sole control over their work. So once again, it needs to address the idea of difficulty or the idea of something not being super, um, you know, convenient or easy, it needs to address that. Um, choice C is too positive, so therefore cannot be correct. Um, and the only choice that addresses difficulty, or the only choice that addresses, um, the only choice that addresses that is choice A that the collective didn't last because we had a difficult time sharing credit and responsibility. That's the exact discussion talked about in the journalist claim that it's difficult for artists to be involved in a collaborative effort because they're used to having control. This is quite a lengthy text and also there's a table. So I'm just gonna make sure that um, I give people like 30 seconds to quickly read it before I start analyzing it. Okay, I'm gonna start reading. Mycorrhizal fungi and soil benefits many plants, substantially increasing the mass of some. A student conducted an experiment to illustrate this effect. The student chose three plant species for an ex the student chose three plant species um, for the experiment. 
including two that are mycorrhizal hosts, species known to benefit, and one non-mycorrhizal species, a species that doesn't benefit and may even be harmed. Student then grew several plants from each species, both in soil containing the fungi and in soil that was treated to kill the fungi and others. After several weeks, the student measured the plant's average ma mass and was surprised to discover that. So, first part of this question requires understanding what the phenomena is being what phenomena is being discussed. The phenomena being discussed is that this fungi benefits many plants and it increases their mass. Um, that's great. And it obviously would only increase their mass in um it will only increase their mass in things that are its host. So um there's two host species, corn and marigold, and there's one non-host species. Secondly, um what you need to understand is this word of surprise, and that's why I underlined it. This world of surprise is indicating to you that the results have to be unexpected because it's already known how the species interact in fungi. The only choice that can be correct for this type of uh, for this type of question setup is choice A. Broccoli grown in soil containing fungi had a slightly higher average mass than broccoli grown in soil that had been treated to kill fungi. Why is that? Broccoli is a non-host of this fungi. Therefore, according to the text and the background information provided, this species should not benefit from and should actually maybe be harmed by the fungi. However, what do we see? When the broccoli is grown in soil with the fungi, its mass is seven and a half. When it's grown in soil treated to kill fungi, its mass is actually less. Therefore, the fungi had a positive effect on the species, although it is not a host. That makes it surprising, which is what the text um, set, set you up for, making the correct answer choice A. Question 18. Several artworks found among the ruins of the ancient Roman city of Pompeii depict a female figure fishing with a cupid nearby. Some scholars have asserted the figure is the goddess Venus, since she is known to have been linked with cupids in Roman culture, but... University of Leicester archaeologist Carla Brain suggests cupids may be, have also been associated with fishing generally. The fact that a cupid is shown near the female figure, therefore, the word therefore indicates to you that this is establishing some sort of conclusion. And the best conclusion that can be established is choice A. The text tells you that although scholars have said the figure has to be Venus, there's a counter argument, or there's a counter perspective that cupids and fishing generally go together. Therefore, um, therefore, just because there is a cupid with a female figure does not fully paint the picture that the, that the figure has to be Venus. Question 19. Literary agents estimate that more than half of all nonfiction books credited to a celebrity or other public figure are in fact written by ghostwriters. Professional authors who were paid to write blank, but whose names never appear on book covers. Well, the question is asking, which choice completes a text so that it conforms to the conventions of standard English? And as you can see, the basic word choice is the same for every question, um, but the grammatical setup is different. This is more so an explicit grammar question. The best answer to this question is choice A. The reason for that is peoples is being used in the possessive context and stories is being used as a noun. People's stories can also be translated to the stories of people. And if you plug this in to the blank or to the question stem, it makes complete sense. Ghost writers are professional authors paid to write other stories of people. Those people being celebrities or public figures. Therefore, this is a correct answer. Um, and we're able to confirm that grammatically as well. Question 20. Like other amphibians, the wood frog, Rana Silva Sil Silvatica, is unable to generate its own heat. So during periods of freezing temperatures, it blank by producing large amounts of glucose, a sugar that helps prevent damaging ice from forming inside its cells. Which choice completes a text that conforms to the convention of standard English? Again, we see 
The word choice is basically the same throughout. It's simply a matter of the grammatical structure. Best choice for this is choice D. Um, we're talk we're using present tense to describe this frog. Is unable present. Uh, helps present. Um, producing present. So the best answer for this uh, is also going to include simple present tense, which is choice D. Twenty one. After a spate of illnesses as a child, Wilma Rudolph was told she might never walk again. Defying all odds, Rudolph didn't just walk. She blanked the 1960 Summer Olympics in Rome. She won both the 100 and 200 meter dashes and clinched first place for her team in the 4 by 100 meter relay, becoming the first U.S. woman to win three gold medals in a single Olympics. Again, same exact question, asking you for grammatical answer. Um, this question is going to require an understanding of the M dash, an understanding of comma, and understanding of periods. Now, the M dash is perhaps one of the most flexible pieces of um, grammatical syntax that we have in the English language. Um, the M dash primarily is used to indicate emphasis. Um, unlike semicolons and periods, there really are no hard and fast rules about where you can put an M dash or not. There can be a complete sentence before an M dash. There can be an incomplete sentence after the M dash. Um, I would say that's typically the most common scenario because, again, the M dash is for emphasis primarily. Um, secondly, what we notice here, which I think perhaps is the most helpful in this question, is that there is a list. And in this list, there are multiple medals being described, right? So it's the 100, 200 meter dashes. It's first place for the four by 100 meter relay. And all this happens in the 1960 Summer Olympics um, in Rome. So knowing that the second sentence is quite lengthy and has a bunch of um, sort of list-like features, that makes the best answer D. And if you plug D in back into the question stem, we can see defying all odds, Rudolph didn't just walk, she ran fast. Again, the M dash is establishing that emphasis. With the period, we then start the next sentence. During this 1916 Summer Olympics, she won both 100 and 200 meter dashes, et cetera, et cetera. The question, um, the question stem now perfectly flows and D is the correct answer. 22. In many of her landscape paintings from the 1970s and 80s, Lebanese artist Etel Adnan worked to capture the essence of California's fog-shrouded Mount Tamal Pais region through abstraction, using splotches of color to represent the area's features. Interestingly, the, air, the triangle representing the mountain itself blank among the few defined figures in her painting. Once again, it's a grammatical question. You need to understand in this choice, subject-verb agreement. We see that there are plural tenses used, like as and were, and there's also singular, like is. So we need to understand what is the subject. The subject of the sentence is the triangle. The triangle has to be singular. That eliminates A, that eliminates C. And reading the sentence, we know that the best tense would be is. Um, so the correct answer is D. Seneca sculptor Mary Watt's blanket art comes in a range of shapes and sizes. In 2004, Watt sewed strips of blankets together to craft a 10 by 13 blank. In 2014, she arranged folded blankets into two large stacks and then cast them in bronze, creating two curving 18-foot tall blue bronze pillows. Once again, a grammatical question. Um, and if you guys can look at the answer choices, you see it's semicolon and comma, differentiation. Now, semicolon... Um, Thankfully, unlike M dashes, have hard and fast rules. They can only be used to separate complete sentences. And regarding commas, commas cannot be followed by complete sentences. That's what we call a comma splice. So this is not allowed. Recognizing this, the best answer for this is choice B. Looking at the length of the sentences and looking at the fact that the sentences are different ideas, uh, having a semicolon in between is going to allow us to take a pause, um, which is important punctuation-wise, and also separate the two complete sentences. African-American Percy Julian was a scientist and entrepreneur 
whose work helped people around the world to see. Nandy 1999 is one of the greatest achievements by U.S. chemists in the past 100 years. Blank led to the first mass-produced treatment for glaucoma. Which choice completes the text so it conforms to this conventional standard English? Now, once again, um, you need to understand what is the subject of this sentence. The sentence starts off by saying, Named in 1999 as one of the greatest achievements by U.S. chemists in the past 100 years, blank led to the first mass-produced treatment for glaucoma. So someone is leading or led to this treatment. Therefore, the subject of after the comma has to be the scientist, Julian themselves. Um, that should immediately follow the comma. That eliminates B and D. Uh, what leaves the best what leaves um the best answer choice is choice c it was julian's 1935 synthesis of the alkaloid physostignine that led to the first mass produced treatment for glaucoma this is grammatically correct choice a introduces an unnecessary semicolon 25 the Arctic Alpine Botanic Garden in Norway and the Jardin Botanical Rio de Janeiro in Brazil are two of the many botanical gardens around the world dedicated to growing diverse plant blank, fostering scientific research, and educating the public about plant conservation. So the question is asking once again grammatically, which choice best completes the text? Um, the best answer for this is choice B. And this is, again, one of those examples where we're not following hard and fast rules, but we're more so understanding the pattern. What we see is, again, there's a form, there's almost a sort of list happening here, fostering scientific research, educating the public about plant conservation, um, dedicated to growing diverse plant species. With this list, because it is slightly more complex, semicolons are being used to separate each clause of the list. Because without the semicolons, um, the sentences are going to be too lengthy and, or will fall into a comma splice, which again uh, is an improper use of a comma. This makes choice B correct. Okay. Sociologist Alton Okanika sits on the review board tasked with adding new sites to the Hawaii Register of Historic Places, which includes um, Pilahanila, Hiao, and the Opeka Road Bridge. Okinaka doesn't make such decisions blank. All historical designations must be approved by a group of nine other experts from the fields. Which choice completes the text? So once again, same setup um, of the verbiage, but different grammar. The best answer to this is... Um, Choice A. Um, using the semicolon, we establish the new sentence following the verb however, which is everything that I just put in this bracket. All right, 27. In 1968, U.S. Congress, Congressman John Conyers introduced a bill to establish a national holiday in honor of MLK. Bill didn't make it, but Conyers was determined. He teamed up with Shirley Chisholm. They resubmitted the bill every session for the next 15 years. Blank. In 1983, the bill passed. Which choice completes the text? Here we're proposed with a series of different transition words. Transition words are meant to transition or indicate uh, a shift in ideas or introduce new facts um, in a smooth way. What do we see? What are we being told? We're told that this bill was being resubmitted for 15 years and it passed after that period of 15 years. What choice is indicating that transition best, choice C. Finally, after 15 years of constant work, constant resubmissions, finally it passed in 1983. 28, geoscientists have long considered Hawaii's Mauna Loa volcano to be the Earth's largest sealed volcano. Blank, according to 2020 study by local geoscientists, Hawaii's Puha Honu shield volcano is significantly larger. So once again, we're being proposed with a series of transitions. The transition that's best matching the sentence is going to indicate what's happening in the sentences. We're, we're first told that there is a long time theory or a long term consideration that it was the Mauna Loa vocation that was the largest. 
And then we're told that in 2020, um, another scientist showed that another volcano is actually larger. That's a contrast being established, making choice D correct with the verb how with the with the transition word, however. Twenty nine. Samuel Coleridge Taylor was a prominent classical music composer who toured the U.S. three times in early 1900s. The child of a West African father and English mother, Coleridge Taylor emphasized his mixed race. For example, he referred to himself as Anglo-African. Blank. He incorporated the sounds of traditional African music into classical music compositions. Once again, the question is on transition words. What are we being told? We're told that this person emphasized his mixed race ancestry. We're given one example of that, that he referred to himself as Anglo-African. The second sentence is another example of that because it talks about the incorporation of African music with classical music. Therefore, the best answer to actually depict that is choice A. The second sentence of talking about the music is giving another example of the incorporation or the blending of um, the mixed race ancestries. Therefore, choice A, in addition, is showing that there's another example being discussed here. Thirty. In 2019, researcher Pat Patricia Huardo Gonzalez and food historian Nova Nasrullah prepared a stew from a 4,000-year-old recipe. When they tasted the dish known as pasutro, they found it had a mild taste and sense of calm. Blank. The researchers, knowing that dishes were sometimes named after the unintended effects, theorized the dish's name unwinding referred to its function. Help diners relax. Okay. So we see here that there's a discussion of preparation of this dish. The second sentence says, um, when the researchers tasted this, they felt a sense of calm. The last sentence states that um, the researchers knew that dishes are named after their function and they theorized this. So there's a very logical sequence of events. Um, they taste something, they feel or they they recognize how it tastes or how it makes them feel. And ultimately, they generate a theory. The best transition indicating that is therefore. Alternately is establishing a contrast. Uh, so is nevertheless somewhat. And likewise, indicating a parallel being drawn or a similarity being drawn. But there are no parallels or similarities being drawn. Like I mentioned, it's a very logical sequence of events. And therefore is the best answer because after knowing this information, um, the researchers are able to formulate this theory. Thirty-one um, is a very interesting type of question, and there are two more questions, and I think we'll take a five-minute break. It's a very interesting set of questions because they're asking you to go through a suit a student set of notes. And answer the question based on the note provided. And so it's essentially asking you to reorganize the information presented here. So I'm going to give everyone like 30 seconds to quickly read through it and then I'll discuss. Okay, now that everyone has gotten a chance to read it, we need to understand the question. Student wants to emphasize the difference between baking soda and baking powder. Which choice uses information from the notes to accomplish this goal? The best answer for this is choice D. 
the reason for that is unfortunately buried within the note. So we just have to find it. So the question is saying, sorry, the answer is saying to produce carbon dioxide in liquids, baking soda needs to be mixed. Baking powder does not. Um, I was able to verify this through this bullet, which says to produce CO2 or carbon dioxide, baking powder needs to be mixed with the liquid, but not with an acidic ingredient. Um, this matches exactly what it said here, that baking powder does not need to be mixed with an acidic ingredient. And um, the baking soda aspect is listed here. To produce carbon dioxide, baking soda needs to be mixed with liquid and an acidic ingredient. So what's common is that both produce carbon dioxide and in both the context is within liquid mixture. Therefore, this setup can be used to describe both the baking soda and the baking powder. However, the soda needs to be mixed with an acidic ingredient and the baking powder does not. All right, last two questions and I think we'll, we'll perhaps take a five to 10 minute break. 32, while researching a topic, a student has taken the following notes. Once again, same exact setup. Unfortunately, we have to dig through the notes to find the answer. What's the question? Student wants to describe unwoven light to an audience unfamiliar with Sue Sunny Park. Which choice is the best? Well, who was Sunny, Sue Sunny Park? That's described right here. And unwoven light is also described right here. Again, if your audience is unfamiliar, you need to understand what is the most important information I need to convey to my audience. The best answer for that is choice D. You're given the piece. It's unwoven light. You're told it's time and uh, context. Time is 2013. The context is Korean American artists, and you're given the full name of the artist. And then after the comma, you're given all the information about what the work shows. 33, while researching a topic, student has the following notes. Once again, same exact setup, different type of question. Students wants to present research to an audience unfamiliar with Angkor Wat. So what is Angkor Wat? So that is um, a structure in the Cambodia that was first built to honor the god Vishnu and then became a Buddhist temple. So again, the unfamiliarity has to do with the Angkor Wat structure. Finally, um, they also discuss Angkor Wat in the context of archaeologist Noah Hidalgo. But again, this is an archaeologist and talking about his analysis. So perhaps that is not going to be um, relevant to the actual text. Um, oh, sorry. The archaeologist is Noah Hidalgo Can Tan. So that is going to be relevant to the text because the question is asking to present their research to the audience unfamiliar with Angkor Wat. So the best answer for that is um, choice C. Choice C presents the research, which uses a, a certain technique. It presents what the research revealed, which was hundreds of images hidden in the temple. And it tells you the temple was um, a Cambodian temple. It defines what the temple was. Um, the other choices, so choice B does not even discuss Angkor Wat. Um, choice D does not discuss the research of TANS, which is a requirement as posed by the question. Choice A although does mention Angkor Wat, does not discuss what it is. So if someone is unfamiliar with it, they will not know what you're talking about. All right, that brings us to module two, which is another 33 questions. Um, let's take a five to six minute break and reconvene at around 8.14. Oh, sorry, reconvene at around um, 8.13.
Okay, let's get started. I hope everyone has reconvened. Um, again, module two has the same exact setup. It's just another module with more questions. So, cash and resale market in which consumers purchase secondhand clothing from stores and online sellers generated ne nearly 30 million globally. Expected to see continued growth, some analysts blank. Revenues will more than double by 2028. All right, so again, this is a pretty positive depiction of what's going on. This industry is continuously growing um, and analysts are making some sort of comment, judgment, or they're relating analysts to revenues. So analysts, what is the job of analysts? Analysts predict things. Analysts, um, again, they analyze data. Best answer for that is choice D. Again, there's a very positive outlook on this industry, so choice C is wrong. Analysts themselves don't produce revenues. They're discussing or they predict revenues. And D doesn't make sense. Analysts would not deny revenues because they expect continued growth. Two, artificially de delivering biomolecules to plant cells is important, but it is difficult. Marketa del Car Carpio Laundry and her colleagues have shown that it may be possible to blank this problem by transmitting molecules for through carbon nanotubes, which can cross cell walls. What's happening here? We're being told of a phenomena that's difficult because there are layers of the plant cell walls. Second sentence says or introduces this idea of a researcher who is blank a problem. How so? By transmitting molecules which cross the cell walls. This seems to be a solution of the problem because the problem itself was transmitting through the layers of the cell wall to begin with. Therefore, what is the best answer? The best answer is choice D, which indicates that there's an overcoming of the problem that's possible. Question three, particle physicists spend much of their time blank what is invisible to the naked eye. Using technology, they closely examine subatomic particles, smallest detectable part of matter. Now, one quick thing that I just want to realize, um, that I just want to say is that Given that I'm reviewing this with everyone on a time crunch, I am skipping some parts of the text that are not super relevant to answering the question. That is because I've already taken this test and I'm basically reviewing it with everyone here now. But I obviously do not recommend or expect or want anyone to sort of bite bits and pieces from the text. Again, I'm just doing that for the sake of time. So um, which choice is the most logical? So we're discussing this concept of researchers using technology and closely examining small parts of matter. Therefore, um, the things that they're studying likely are going to be um, invisible to the naked eye. And they're looking at these things, they're spending their time observing these things, examining these things. So again, looking, examining, observing, best matches what? B, inspecting. Four, Anthropologist Carlson and colleagues examined the fossilized clavicle and shoulder bones of a homonym known as little foot. They found these bones were blank, the clavicle and shoulder bones of modern apes that are frequent climbers, such as gorillas and chimpanzees, suggesting little foot had adapted, adapted to life in the trees. Well, if little foot had adapted to life in the trees, that means there was a parallel drawn between modern apes who are frequent climbers. If little foot is also living life in the trees or adapted to that, they also therefore need to climb. Therefore, this is a comparison that is drawn, making choice B comparable to the correct answer. Five, Raidra Wong, the protagonist of Babel 17, is a poet, an occupation which in Delaney's work is not blank. Nearly a dozen of the characters, nearly a dozen of the characters populating his novels are poets or writers. What do we see? We're seeing a specific discussion of Delaney's work, which is Babel 17. Next sentence talks generally about his novels, saying that uh, a dozen of the characters populating his novels are poets or writers. Therefore, this is a specific case that is being illustrated to depict what is exactly being said in the second sentence. This specific case is showing us that, again, the poet profession is very common in the books. The second sentence is being building off of that, saying that this profession is very common in his novels. This makes the best answer B. It's atypical. It's not, it's not surprising. Um, it's not atypical or it's not surprising that this protagonist was also a poet. Six. For a 2020 exhibition, Okunla Jayafus blank a series of new series a series of new images based on a series of alphabet posters from the 1970s 
known as Black ABCs, featuring Black kids, children from Chicago. Joy first photographed the now adult models and layered the photos or magnified images of the model cell, resulting in what he called the micro and macro portraiture. Which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise um, word or phrase? So they're discussing a photographer and neurobiologist, and they're discussing a piece known as um, Black ABCs. And they're saying that this is a series of new images based on the series. Um, and uh, JFS photographed the now adult models and layered that over magnified images of the model selves. So clearly this photographer is taking a lot of liberty in working with these with these pieces. Um, it seems pretty obvious that he is the crea uh, he's the creator of these things and therefore he's created the series of new images. Seven. In addition to being an accomplished psychologist, Phil Sumner was a blank, increasing the opportunity for Black students to study psychology, helping to found the psychology department at Howard University. Which choice completes the text? So once again, it seems like this individual is a psychologist and his role at Howard University was to establish the psychology department. Given that Howard University is a university that serves students, it, it most logically follows that this person supports um, black students in studying psychology. Um, he's not a beneficiary or he's not benefiting from this himself. Um, he is a proponent of, he's an advocate for, he's someone who um, you know, advocates for and strongly believes in increasing opportunity for Black students to study psychology. That makes the best answer A. Number eight, whether the reign of a French monarch such as Hughes Capet or Henry I was historically consequential or relatively uneventful, its trajectory was shaped by questions of legitimacy and therefore cannot be understood without a correlated understanding of the factors that allowed the monarch to blank his right to hold the thorn, the throne. This is an excellent example of a question where the correct answer may not be something that you are familiar with as a reader, and that is okay. We can understand this answer by understanding why everything else is incorrect. They're discussing that um, there are a lot of questions of legitimacy when it comes to uh, reigning monarchs. And to understand you know, the time of the reigning monarchs, we need to understand the factors that allowed the monarch to blank his right to hold the throne. So clearly it's either, you know, to hold his right to hold the throne, to get that right in the first place, it or it's either to, uh, to give that right away. Um, the question, the answer choice has to correctly um, discuss something in relationship with the right. And reciprocate does not make sense. Reciprocate is typically used between two people to reciprocate a relationship, reciprocate things. Disengage doesn't make sense. Annotate doesn't make sense. The best answer, therefore, is betress. And this answer may not be something that jumps out at you. I, for one, did not know the definition of this. But this answer um, is correct. And the definition of betress is to, um, to justify or reinforce. And that makes perfect sense in the context of the sentence, that in order to understand the reign of these monarchs, you need to understand the factors allowing the monarch to justify his right to hold the throne. Think about it. If we're talking about a complex time period where there are multiple people fighting for the throne, we need to figure out what was it that allowed the ruling monarch to justify holding the throne in the first place or to justify getting the throne. All right, nine, some bird species don't raise their own chicks. Instead, adult females lay their eggs in other nests next to another um, bird species own eggs. Female cuckoos have been seen quickly laying eggs in the nest of other bird species. After the eggs hatch, non-cuckoo parents raise the cuckoo chicks as if they were own. Which choice describes the function of the underlying sentence? The first two sentences generally talk about bird species and the process of adult females laying eggs in other nests. The underlying sentence now specifically introduces the cuckoo species and the phenomena where they quickly lay eggs in the nests of other bird species while the other birds are out looking for food. Therefore, the underlying text is providing a specific example of the behavior discussed. This best matches with choice C. We do not talk about physical females of uh, features of female cuckoos 
We do not talk specifically about um, the cuckoo nest at all. In fact, the eggs are being hatched in other nests. Um, we do not talk about reactions of birds, other birds to cuckoo behavior. We don't even see the birds interacting with the cuckoo itself because the cuckoo leaves um, and the non-cuckoo are primarily responsible for raising. All right, 10. Cats judge unseen people's positions in space by sound of their voices, thus reacting with surprise when the same person calls to them from two different locations in a short span of time. Takagi and call colleagues reached this conclusion by measuring cats' level of surprise based on their ear and head movements, while the cats heard recordings of owners' voices from two speakers spaced far apart. Cats exhibited low level of surprise when owners' voices were played twice from the same speaker, but showed a high level of surprise when the voice was played each one's from two different speakers. Question is asking, how did the researchers determine the level of surprise displayed by the cats? That's given to you directly in the text. They reached the conclusion by measuring cats' level of surprise based on ear and head movements. Correct answer is therefore A. Okay. 11, student performs an experiment testing hypothesis that a slightly acidic soil environment is more beneficial for Brassica rapa parenchinesis, then neutral soil. She plants 16 seeds of choisome in a mixture of equal amounts of coffee ground, which is acidic, and potting soil, another 16 without coffee grounds. Two groups of seeds exposed to same growing conditions monitored for three weeks. Which finding, if true, would weaken the student's hypothesis? Very important that you're looking at the question being asked. If it needs to weaken the hypothesis, it must go against the background knowledge. The background knowledge that is known or the actual hypothesis is acidic is good and neutral is bad. What is the opposite of that? The opposite of that is choice A. The choice some planted without coffee grounds were taller than the choice some planted in the mixture with coffee grounds. That is the opposite because clearly here the neutral environment or without coffee grounds environment was more beneficial than the acidic environment which had the coffee grounds. 12. The Young Girl is a 1920 short story by Catherine Mansfield. In the story, Nara takes a 17-year-old girl and her brother out for a meal. In describing the teenager, Mansfield contrasts the character's pleasant appearance with her unpleasant attitude as when Mansfield writes. So again, what are they contrasting? Pleasant appearance, unpleasant attitude and the question wants you to pull a quote illustrating that best answer for that is b she dabbed her lovely nose she loathed the puff um again loathing is a very strong word indicating like a sense of hatred or disgust but she's dabbing her lovely nose though again a contrast between her behavior and her physical appearance all right 13 once again, pretty hefty question. They're giving you a whole page to answer this. Requires you to understand the graph and also the text. High levels of public uncertainty about which pub economic policy the country will adopt can make planning difficult. Measures of such certainty have not been very detailed. Recently, economist Sandley, um, Sandley analyzed trends in these reports to derive measures not only for general uncertainty, but also for uncertainty related to specific areas of policy. One revelation of her work is that a general measure may not fully reflect uncertainty about specific areas of policy, as in the case of United Kingdom, where general policy uncertainty. Okay, so she's saying general does not equal specific. So general anxiety about things may not reflect anxiety in other specific realms. Question is asking, which choice most effectively uses data? Um, to illustrate the claim. So the claim is about general economic policy. And we see that general economic policy is varying throughout, varying with respect to trade and public spending, tax and public spending, and trade. The best answer to this is D. D is highlighting the fact that the general economic policy uncertainty was not always aligning, if ever, with policy uncertainty regarding specific subjects. For example, in 2005, it was substantially lower than trade, and in 2010, it was substantially higher. 
that's showing that the general eco uh, economic policy, again, is not the best reflection of how people feel about specific policies. If you go through the other choices, um, they're either incorrect or based on the graph. So they're telling you the wrong information. Or again, they're not showing what the um, analysts saw, which was the fact that economic policy uncertainty is not evenly distributed across different areas. 14. Linguist Deborah Tannen has cautioned against framing contentious issues in terms of two highly competitive perspectives, such as pro versus con. This debate-driven approach strips issues of their complexity and when used in front of an audience is less informative than the presentation of multiple perspectives in a non-competitive format. To test this hypothesis, students studied conducted a study in which they showed participants one of three different versions of local news commentary. Each version featured a debate with two commentators with opposing views, a panel with various views, or a single commentator. Which most strongly supports Tannen's hypothesis? Well, once again, what is her hypothesis? Her hypothesis is debate-driven approaches are less informative um, than, presentation, than presenting multiple uh, perspectives in a non-competitive format. That's all listed over here. Therefore, the multiple panel... Um, the, the panel with people from with multiple views, the panel that has three commentators with various views is going to be more informative than the debate format. That best matches um, that best matches choice C. On average, those who watch the panel correctly answered more questions about the issue than those who watched the debate or the single commentator. Again, she claimed that it's more informative for people to listen to something in a non-competitive format that best matches C. King Lear is a circa 1606 play by Shakespeare. In the play, King Lear tests his three daughters' devotion to him. He later expresses regret as is evidence when he. What choice uses a quotation um, to illustrate the claim? The, it has to show regret. It has to show um, it has to show it has to show like Again, as I mentioned, regret. The best answer to that is choice C. Um, choice A is solely talking about himself. I am a man, more sinned. That's not necessarily describing regret. Um, choice D, once again, um, says of himself, talking about himself. Choice B, he's, talk he's talking during a storm. Um, the tempest will not give me leave to ponder. Once again, no regret says to himself while striking his head. So he's talking to himself and he's hitting or striking his head. Beat at this gate that lets Sai folly in. Again, folly means like foolishness things, etc. And Sai dear judgment out. So he's saying, he's beating his head and he's saying, this gate let folly in and judgment out. So it shows that he recognizes his foolishness and that he lost judgment. All right. 16. Shakespeare's strategies address broad themes that still appeal to today's audience. Romeo and Juliet, set in Italy at Shakespeare's time, tackled the themes of parents versus children, love versus hate. Play continues to be read and produced widely around the world. But understanding Shakespeare history plays can require a knowledge of several centuries of English history. Consequently, okay, once again, there's a contrast being established. They're saying it's a very, very popular thing, but it requires, the plays require you to really understand uh, history. So they're, they're contrasting tragedies, which are very popular even today with popular themes and appeals to audiences even today with plays that require knowledge. So which choice logically completes the text? So choice C is out because it's only talking about Romeo and Juliet. The best answer is choice A. Theatergoers and readers are likely to find Shakespeare's history plays less engaging in the tragedies. This choice is correct because it's connecting the history and the tragedies um, together. Um, therefore being the correct answer. 17. Ancestral prevalence, a civilization from which present-day Pueblo tribes descended, emerged as early as 1500 in an area of what is known as southwestern U.S., dispersed suddenly in late 1200s, abandoning established villages with systems for farming crops and turkeys. Recent analysis comparing Turkey remains as Meza Verde, one such village in southern Colorado, 
The samples from modern turkey populations in Rio Grande of north central New Mexico determined latter birds descended in part from turkeys cultivated at Mesa Verde shared genetic markers appearing only after 1280. Thus, researchers concluded. There's a lot going on here. Um, we have the Pueblans who dispersed in 1200s. Then we're talking about recent analysis comparing turkey remains at Mesa Verde. Um, the choice most logically completing the text is choice B. The reason why is... Um, the reason why is... Just give me one second... Okay. The reason why is um Mesa Verde was a village in southern Colorado which is likely the uh the southwestern United States. They're comparing that to samples from modern day populations. Given that the latter birds descended from turkeys cultivated at Mesa Verde. So what is latter? Latter is what is most recently introduced. Former is what was introduced first. So latter is Rio Grande. They're saying the latter came from turkeys at Mesa Verde. They're, they share origin with turkey from Mesa Verde and shared genetic markers come after 1280. What also happened in the 1200s? The Pueblans abandoned their villages. So the most logical answer is when they abandoned their villages, they migrated to the Rio Grande area. They carry their farming practices with them, which is why the turkeys are now showing genetic marker similarities. 18. One challenge when researching whether holding elected office changes the person's behavior is the problem of ensuring the experiment has an like appropriate control group. To reveal the effect of holding office, researchers must compare people who hold office with people who do not, but who are otherwise similar. Since researchers are unable to control which politicians win elections, they therefore... The purpose of this paragraph, the point of this paragraph is talking about an appropriate control. We need to find people who are similar to office holders, but the only difference must be they do not hold office. What best choice recognizes that theme and uses that to complete the text? Choice D. Researchers can't control who wins elections. That's why they can never figure out who is the control group because again the control group needs to be people who are similar to office holders but they're just not in office themselves choice c is opposite um the control group should not differ from office holders in significant ways that's exactly opposite um d is the best answer 19 in his book bengali harlem and the lost histories of south asian america vivek bald uses newspapers census records ship logs and memoirs to tell the blank who made NYC their home in the 20th century? Standard English, this is a grammatical question. Okay, well, um, we see the setup. Story or stories? Best answer, it makes sense that they're, it's a plural because they're telling the stories of multiple people. Again, um, he's telling memoirs. Some memoirs are going to be of multiple people. Common sense would also tell you this is not like an autobiography. It's going to be of multiple people. Um the immigrants are nouns. We don't need the possessive for that. So choice C is the best answer. 20. In memory tests and autobiography, Haradina Pindle explored themes, blank, healing, self-discovery, and memory. What choice best completes the sentence? Um, I think clearly this one is choice A. You don't need a comma or an M dash or a colon. 21. Sona Charyapotra, an Indian American, and Doniel Clayton, an African American, were frustrated by a lack of diverse characters in books. In 2011, they joined forces to found Cake Literary, a book packaging blank, specializing in the creation and promotion of stories told from diverse perspectives. Um, what best answer, what best is standard English? The answer to this is choice B. These two writers joined forces to found Cake Literary, a book packaging company that specializes in the creation and promotion of diverse perspectives. 22. I really do think one of the best ways to answer these questions, given that they're standard grammar, is to just plug them into the question stem and see if it makes sense. Um, study led by scientist Rebecca at U Wisconsin Madison found that black bears eating human food before hibernation have increased levels of a rare carbon isotope, 
due to higher 13 C levels in corn and cane sugar. All right, what choice completes the text standard English? Well, we see carbon 13 and then we see 13 C. Logically, 13 C is an abbreviation for carbon 13, so parentheses can be used. Um, secondly, the rare carbon isotope is introduced with a comma, if you guys see right here. Therefore, it's basically an adjunct clause or an extra clause embedded within the main sentence. Adjunct clause are typically separated by commas. So you'll have a separate clause just giving more information. The main clause will be outside the commas. Therefore, you need a comma at the end um, of the adjunct clause. And because this is only an abbreviation of carbon-13, the best answer is D. And if you imagine this sentence plugged in, it both looks and sounds completely correct. All right. In 2010, Noel Hidalgo Tan was visiting the 12th century temple of Angkor Wat when he noticed markings of red paint on the temple. Blank, the help of digital aiming techniques, he discovered the markings are part of an elaborate mural. Okay. Um, when he noticed markings of red paint on the temple walls, with the help of digital imaging techniques, he discovered what? So the best answer is D. These are two separate findings. He first notices, then he uses digital imaging techniques. You separate the sentences, everyone is happy, the sentences are complete and correct. All right. Working from an earlier discovery of Charpentier's chemists, Charpentier and Doudna, winners of the 2020 Nobel Prize, recreated and reprogrammed so-called genetic scissors of a species of DNA claiming bacteria, blank a tool that is revolutionizing the field of gene technology. The best answer, again, is going to sound correct when you plug it in, and it's going to make the most sense. Um, what did they do? These scientists recreated, reprogrammed genetic scissors, and what did that do? That created a tool revolutionizing the field of gene technology. They did this to forge a tool. Another strategy I want to recommend here is something that I call eliminating the fluff. It's really important to recognize what the question is asking you and how you can get to the right answer by making things as simple as possible for yourselves. Here, it seems like there needs to be a verb that is indicative by the questions you're given. So eliminating the fluff means you're going to eliminate everything else from the sentence that you don't need to answer the question. So I can simplify the question and say, Chemist, Charpentier, and Jennifer Dudna, I don't care that they're Nobel Prize winners, recreated and reprogrammed genetic scissors. And what did this do? They did this to forge a tool. So read the whole sentence. Chemist, Charpentier, and Dudna recreated and reprogrammed genetic scissors to forge a tool revolutionizing the field of gene technology. Removing the fluff just makes sure that you're able to read the sentence and focus on the most important part and not be distracted by other things. 25. In 2016, Vanessa Galvez oversaw the installation of bioswills by vegetated channels designed to absorb and divert stormwater along streets of Queens by reducing the runoff flowing to city sewers. Okay. So the comma introduced after city sewers means that you need to introduce the subject that has successfully reduced the runoff. What is that subject? That subject is bioswills. Bioswills are designed to absorb and divert stormwater. Therefore, what needs to immediately follow the comma? The term bioswills. That is seen in B and C. Now, um, grammatically, the best answer is B. C is unnecessarily lengthy, and the um, verb setup is awkward and inappropriate. I'll just give everyone a second to like quickly read that. Okay. 26. Study published by Rice University in 2019 offers a new explanation for the origin of Earth's blank structures called arcs, towering ridges that form a dense oceanic plate subducts unless the less dense one. All right. Which choice completes the text so it conforms? Um... Answer is B. Um, a makes a sentence way too lengthy by having no punctuation. B is the best answer. The new explanation offered is being introduced by a colon. Colons can often be used for defining terms. 
or two, introduce lists. By using the colon here, they're indicating that the new explanation is what's after the colon. And the new explanation is arcs um, form when dense ocean plates subduct under less dense ones. Okay. Um, the next set of questions are once again asking you to go through someone's notes and then make logical conclusions. So let's just get to those set of questions quickly. Um, Okay. During 2021 launch, Rocket Lab's Electron Rocket experienced an unexpected failure. Its second stage booster shut down suddenly after ignition. Blank, instead of downplaying the incident, Rocket Lab CEO publicly acknowledged what happened and apologized. Okay. So clearly, the incident has had to already happen for the CEO to acknowledge it and apologize for it. Therefore, the best answer has to be something indicating that shift in time. And the best answer is A. The launch happened. Afterwards, the CEO publicly acknowledged and apologized. Everything else like, doesn't make sense. 28. When soil becomes contaminated, it can be removed from the ground and disposed in a landfill. Blank contaminated soil can be detoxified by a photoremediation. Plants that can with withstand high concentrations of metals absorb pollutants and store them in their shoots, which are cut off. What choice completes the text with the most logical transition? Okay. So again, we're talking about two different processes. The first is disposing um, soil. The second is the decontamination or detoxification of soil by this process. Therefore, we're introducing two ways to um, decontaminate soil or decontaminate the environment. One is just throw it out. The second is follow this process of storing toxic things in plants and um preserving soil and also preserving plants. This is therefore indicating a contrast, making choice A the best example, the best answer choice. It's an alternative. All right. I'm not going to read through the bullets for the sake of time. Student wants to explain advantage of how can read calendar, which choices use its relevant information. So an advantage is something positive for the Henry hunk and something negative or something not positive about the other calendar. So what do we see about the Henry Honk? So the Henry Honk is permanent and has 364 days. Further, because it has 364 days, the scheduling is predictive. On the other hand, the Gregorian calendar has 365 days. And because of that, calendar dates are different every year. So clearly the advantage is predictable scheduling for Henry Honk, unpredictable scheduling for Gregorian because Gregorian calendars have different days um, every year. The best answer choice depicting that is choice C. Henry Honk is more predictable than the Gregorian calendar, and the reason for that is because it is designed so calendar dates would happen on the same day of the week each year. All right. 30. Student wants to present the influence theory to the audience unfamiliar with the uh, Haronosani Confederacy. Which choice is most effective? So in order to understand this, you need... Um, we need to understand who is the uh, Har Harusani Confederacy. We're told that in bullet one, it's a thousand year old alliance of six native nations. All right, choice A does not even discuss the Harusani Confederacy at all, so it's automatically incorrect. The question requires you to talk about them. Choice B is also incorrect because we're simply name dropping the Harusani Confederacy given no context of who they are. Um. The best answer is choice C. The reason is, although they don't explicitly state the Harusani Confederacy, they do state the influence theory, which is that the principles of the great law of peace influence the U.S. Constitution, and they embed the definition of the Harusani Confederacy, um, the definition being an alliance of six native nations within the sentence itself. Choice D is also correct because it does not actually talk about the influence theory. The influence theory is very well defined in the notes where it says this theory is the influence theory and that theory believes the principles of great law of peace influence the constitution. All right, question 31. Students wants to emphasize how hot the sun is relative to nearby stars, which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes? Okay. Um... The best answer is choice A. We get a temperature of the sun. 
we get a classification of the sun that is a G star, and we're told the sun is hotter than most stars with nearby it. That correctly emphasizes how hot the sun is nearby relative to everything else. Um, choice B is incorrect because although we're given a temperature of the sun, we're not told um, what it means for parset for other stars to be A through F. We don't know if A. Uh, we don't know if A through F is actually hotter than the sun. All we're told, all all we are told is the sun is ninety eight thousand. We're not told how that compares to the stars nearby. Um, choice C is completely out because we have no context of how hot the sun is. Choice D is also out because, um, once again, we do not know whether K, M, A, or F means it's hotter or cooler than the sun. We're just told this is the temperature of the sun and it's a G star. Choice A correctly gives the temperature of the sun and also tells us comparatively how that temperature compares to stars around it. All right, 32 and 33, thanks so much for bearing with me, everyone. We're almost close to the end. Um, student wants to introduce Catherine Halverson's book to an audience familiar with Atlantic Monthly. Um, which choice is most effective? Choice C is incorrect because it's fully defining Atlantic Monthly, that it's first published 1857, it's focusing on politics, art, and literature. We don't need that definition if the audience is already familiar. Um, choice B is incorrect because it is not talking about... The, the main focus is not the book. It's simply saying a magazine referred to the book, but we don't have an understanding of, or we're not introduced to the book itself. Choice A is the correct answer. Catherine Halverson's Faraway Woman at the Atlantic Monthly discusses female authors whose autobiographies appear in the magazine in the 1900s. This is correct because we're being told the subject of the book and we're not given an over, over explanation of Atlantic Monthly, which was first published in 1857. 33. Student wants to emphasize similarity between the two ways a magnificent fridge gate bird acquires food. All right, well, it's a similarity, so we need to understand what is similar. So this bird feeds mainly on fish, tuna, squid, other sea small animals. It does not dive into the water. It either snatches prey from the surface or takes bird food from other birds by force. So the similarity is it never dives into the water, and these two are examples indicating how it eats despite not diving for food. The best answer is therefore B. B says, neither of a magnificent frigate bird's two ways of acquiring water requires diving. That was a similarity. Um, and again, it's emphasized here. Choice C is irrelevant because it does not talk about the similarity at all. It's talking about one of the ways. Choice D is incorrect because, once again, we're not establishing a similarity. We're just told this is way one and this is way two. Choice A, although does correctly state that the bird never dies, it only illustrates one way that th this occurs. So it sounds more so like an example rather than emphasis. Choice B is the best answer, but it's clearly emphasizing that in two ways of acquiring food, neither require diving into water. So that clearly illustrates the similarity between two ways of meal, meal prepping for this bird. Okay, so that was the entire reading module, um, which is a total of, I believe, 66 questions. Um, tomorrow we will go over the math, which, as I mentioned, um, is another set of changed question types for the new SAT. Calculator is permitted for everything. Um, and yeah, we'll go through the math tomorrow. But if no other questions are on the call, then everyone can have a great rest of their night and I will see everyone tomorrow. Any questions? I hope this was helpful for everyone who was in attendance.
If no one has any other questions, then I'm going to end the meeting for tonight. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.